Welcome back, friend. So, we just got shot with the lunar cannon, but instead of to the moon, we just shot a rope and climbed across the ridge, I guess, and got to the mountains where apparently the elation lives, since this is an elation. There's a slight updraft here. The wind has channeled through that chasm down there and blown out and up here. Interesting that there's just a random updraft right there. It's a leathery creature with wings, like a mix between a giant bat and a pterodactyl. <laughs> it must be one of the elation. It looks more like a warrior than a storyteller, though. I hope it speaks English. I mean, all tongue. Let's hope. Because... The Marum did not. It's an elation. Can you help me across? You are human, and we don't allow human strangers into our village. If you wish to trade, let us know where your ship is anchored, and we will send traders to you with our merchandise. I don't have a ship, and I didn't come here to trade. I came to talk to your leaders. I'm sorry. But we don't allow strangers into our village. <laughs> so let me just immediately revert my story and lie. I don't see what purpose this will serve, but for the sake of completion. Actually, I am a traitor. Where is your ship anchored? In, um, Coconut Grove? There is no Coconut Grove on Elias. But there is one near me. So, I'm not a traitor, but I am a friend of the Alation people. We don't know you. There is no friendship between strangers, human. Makes sense. Don't your people have a prophecy about a stranger who comes without a ship? Or something like that? I don't know of any prophecies, human. What kind of prophecies do you know about? We don't tell our stories to strangers. What's up this road? The Alation village of Tamar. Where's the Alation village of Tamar? Up this road and into the volcano. We're just going in circles now, aren't we? Isn't it dangerous to live inside a volcano? This volcano has not erupted for thousands of years. And the gods protect us. We are safe here. Is there another way to get into the volcano? No. This pass is the only way. I'm sure there's a secret cave somewhere that leads into the volcano. No, there isn't. There's always a secret cave. Not here. Are you absolutely sure there's no secret cave? Human, you talk too much, even for an elation. Thank you. <laughs> yes, but you must leave now. Thank you for that insult. Oh, we can't even go back once we came. Okay. Well. Okay, well, I think that... That light as a leaf potion is going to help us, hopefully. Ideally. I don't know how much of an updraft this updraft is. Oh, God, I think I'm going to throw up. That was so not appetizing. I don't know. thing, though. I do feel lighter. Like I lost 90 pounds. I can't even imagine what people would pay for this stuff back home. Whoa, I'm fly! Not. <laughs> I guess I still weigh too much to be carried on that slight updraft. Okay, it's slight. I don't remember her being, um, her saying that it was disgusting last time she drank it, just saying. Well, I think we can, uh, make that updraft go a bit stronger with some wind. That's the last of it, unfortunately. Dang. Oh my god. Woohoo! That would have been uh. human. You flew across the chasm. You don't have wings, but still, 
You fly like the elation. Believe me, I'm as shocked as you are. Are you the Windbringer? I know who you are, but what am I? Me? No, I'm just a guardsman. I only have one story, and my wings do not yet support me for more than a day's flight. You are the Windbringer. It's said that someone not of the elation shall come among us to float on the wind like an elation, to learn our stories, to bring the wind back to us, and to bring us into a new and happier age. Is that all? You know, I'm starting to forget how simple my life used to be. Family, friends, grades, boys, no prophecies, nobody looking to me for salvation. I don't understand, Windbringer. You should speak with our teller up in the city. She'll be wanting to see you, I'm sure. We've waited for the Windbringer for a very long time. The teller? Thanks. No, Windbringer. Thank you. She mentions family, but it, from what she said, that doesn't seem to be a simple part of her life. And actually seemed to be like something she was trying to leave. But, uh, yeah. It's an elation. Alright. Let us through. Oh, hello. It's an old man, I think. Difficult to tell, since they're all kind of wrinkly. Well, I'm glad you didn't say that out loud. Hello. Good day, stranger. What would you hear among the elation? I need to speak with the teller. The teller? Uh, go down into the city and you will see the castle. The teller, she keeps to the tower. She's old and her eyes don't take well to the sun. It's Mr. Mieran's voice actor. <laughs> I was like... It sounds so familiar and I couldn't think for a moment who it was. Oh, there wait, is there anything? There is. Nature's reclaiming lost ground. The contrast between wilderness and civilization is such a striking image. I almost wish I had my canvas and paints with me now. When the city was inhabited by its original population, that tower was probably an important one, part of a temple or a palace. Now, though, it's just another ruin. The flowers will one day cover the walls and ruins. And man's creation will be forever lost to nature. So poetic, April. I knew you were an artist, but a poet? I mean, poets are artists, but you know what I mean. The tower has toppled, though what caused it, I can only guess. Disuse, perhaps? Or an earthquake? Seriously. Even the way she's phrasing that, quite poetic for an 18-year-old. The tower has toppled, though what caused it... All right. Let's go. Am I? Okay. Thought I killed something for a sec. Who's playing this music? It's a nest. They don't all seem to live in nests, though. There are quite a few inhabited buildings in this village. Well, now that looks like a nest that we saw in those caves, so now I can confirm that those are Alation nests. I don't know how April just magically knew that. Well, I guess they're magic since so she's strong in magic. Why is he perched on top of that pillar? Who knows? It's a little Alation girl. It's a young Alation female working with clay. Be careful, don't come too close. I'm almost done with this pot. It's Emma's voice actress. Sorry. Are you here to buy pottery? I didn't think traders were allowed up here. No, I came to speak with your teller. Really? I didn't know the teller spoke with anyone from the outside. You must be a very special girl. Supposedly. My name's April, by the way. Nima is my name. Nima of Tama. The only Alation village on Alace. I like your pottery. It's our craft. That and storytelling. But storytelling can't buy merchandise or food. I know a lot of people who live by telling stories, although I guess that's kind of different. They are lucky then. 
Not that I don't enjoy making pottery. It's good to feel the wet clay between my claws, to shape it into whatever I wish. It's almost like creating a new life, I think. I don't have a husband yet, so I haven't tried. Have you? Do you have a husband and children? Neither, thank God. I don't think I'm ready for that yet. I was 18 turnings this spring. I'm ready for a husband, but I've yet to court anyone who could make me soar on the winds. I think the men of Tom are dull and timid. What about the guard on the road below the village? He's our age, isn't he? Isan? He's quite pretty. And his wings are big, but I don't think he likes me. He never looks at me or talks to me. That doesn't mean anything. He could just be shy. Maybe you could talk to him, find out who he likes. But don't say I sent you. Sure, I can do that. Thank you, April. Thank you, Nima. You're welcome, April. Well, I like her. She's nice. Hi there. What you doing? Playing. Yeah? What are you playing? Nothing. My daddy's in the castle watch. He's allowed to sharpen his claws. Really? Okay. My daddy owns a farm. Yeah? Do you have animals there? Sure. He has some cows and some horses and... What? What's cows and horses? Well, cows are big, brown, fat animals with four legs and white spots. And they go moo a lot. <laughs> and horses? Horses are fun to be around. They run really fast and they can jump over tall fences and they look beautiful and graceful. But the best thing about horses is that you can ride them. I can run fast too, but I can't fly yet. My wings aren't fully formed. But when I grow up, I'll fly far away and see everything. I'll go see your horses. That would be nice. My name's April, what's yours? Saina, will you be my friend, April? Of course, Saina, as long as you promise to be my friend. I promise. Do you know where the teller lives? Over there in the castle tower. My daddy's watching the entrance so that only nice people can get in. Do you think he'll let me in? I don't know if you're nice, but you have to ask my daddy. Where are the other children in your village? Oh, they're in school now. And why aren't you in school? Because I'm ahead of everyone else. I'm really smart, you know. I'm the only youngling to have learned the first tale this soon. So some days, I get to do what I want. It's a little boring, though. I wish I was in school. At least there I could sing and play and jump around with all the other children. Why don't you go to school anyway? Because they say I would just distract the other children who are still learning their first tales. It's not fair. I mean, I get to play by myself and everything, but that's not fun all day. And my mommy's working on her pottery at home, and she doesn't want me disturbing her because she might make a mistake. But the day after tomorrow, I get to go back to school because then we're gonna learn some more flying lessons. They're always a lot of fun, and I'm getting pretty good at that, too. I bet. I wish I had wings like you do. Yes, they're very good to have when you fly. Have fun, Saina. Are you leaving? Yes, I'm sorry, but there are some things I have to do. Grown-ups are always too busy. I mean, I just spoke to you for a good while, I think. Halt! Who would visit the teller? I'm the Windbringer. The Windbringer? You are not the Windbringer. Are you? How else would I have been able to get up here? I am the Windbringer. If so, 
you must prove that you are of the elation. There are four tales from the four corners of the world that you must know by heart. They are the tale of winds, the tale of stars, the tale of sea, and the tale of homecoming. I will ask you one question from each tale, and you must answer each correctly, or you cannot be the windbringer. Are you ready? I think that's the voice of Father Raul. No, give me some time to prepare. Then return when you are ready, and I will test your knowledge of the four tales. Good thing there are one, two, three, old guy four, and the one up front five. So, well, I don't know if he'll tell me a story, so. I just realized I didn't try. Whoop. It's Nima. It's Nima. Hi, Nima. Hi, April. Do you know one of the four tales of winds, stars, sea, and homecoming? I had to learn the tale of homecoming. It took a long time, but I think I got it now. I'm better with pottery than I am with the tales, unfortunately. Do you want to hear it? Please. Very well. This is the tale of homecoming, my tale, and I shall tell it in my own words as told to me by my teacher, in her words, and by her teacher in turn. Moran was a handsome young Alation man with strong wings and a hearty beak. He lived below the white cliffs where the water was salty and the fish plentiful. Moran was betrothed to Anara, the loveliest girl there ever was. She was fair and slender and tall, and her eyes were the clearest shade of blue. But Moran was hesitant to enter into union with Anara, to become her husband and to give her children. He would always come up with a new excuse for why they had to wait a little while longer. Now, Anara was skilled at pottery, but even more so with stories. And the teller of the village had many times asked Anara to be her apprentice, to learn all the tales, so that someday she could take over as the teller. But Anara refused, knowing that if she did accept the teller's offer, she would never be able to marry Moran, because a teller cannot have a husband nor children of her own. Her refusal to become the teller's apprentice was unheard of, because who could refuse such an honor? But to Anara, love was more important. Her love for Moran was beyond honor, beyond reason. But despite Anara's love, Moran was still hesitant. And then one day, he told Anara, I am traveling on a pilgrimage to the far shores. I will be gone for some time. And while I am traveling, and in accordance with our traditions, I will be freed from our betrothal. Not until I come back will the bond between us be renewed. It was not unusual for a young Alation man at that time to go on a pilgrimage, and the bond between the betrothed would often be cut while he was away, to be formed again upon his return. But Anara was heartbroken, because she had thought that Moran would soon want to marry her. When Moran saw her tears, he said to her, Do not weep. When I come back, I promise I will marry you. Just wait for me, and stay with your pots, to make the time pass quickly. And then Moran left on his pilgrimage to the far shores. Many years went by, and Moran had exciting adventures on the far shores. But by and by, he began to long for home, and for Anara. And now he had finally realized that he loved her, and that he wanted to marry her. But when he returned, he could not find Anara amongst the pot makers. He went to visit her family, and they told him that, after waiting for many years, Anara accepted the teller's offer of apprenticeship and that when the teller left on the last wind during the previous winter, Anara herself became the new teller. Angry, Moran made his way to the teller's nest, and when he saw Anara, he said to her, You promised me you would wait! But Anara did not say a single word in answer. She just turned around and lifted something wrapped in leaves from the cot behind her and gave it to Moran. Moran unwrapped the package, and inside he found an old pot cracked and broken in two. What is this pot? he asked. And why did you not wait for me like I asked you to? And finally, Anara spoke, and she said to Moran, I made this pot for you, my dear Moran, when you left, because I wanted it to be my marriage gift to you. 
But when many, many years passed, I finally realized that you did not love me the way I loved you, and to live hoping otherwise would be death. But I want to marry you, cried Moran. I came back. But Inara just nodded at the broken pot in Moran's hands and said, like an old pot that is left without care, a heart may break in two, and a broken heart can never be mended. And so Anara turned away, never to speak with Moran again. And Moran's heart, like the pot that was left untended, broke in two, because absence makes a heart brittle. This was the tale of homecoming, my tale, and I told it in my own words as told to me by my teacher, and as I will tell it to my student when the time comes. Bye, Nima. Goodbye, April. Well, thank you for that. Hi, Saina. Hi, April. You're really smart, so maybe you know one? Do you know one of the four tales of winds, stars, sea, and homecoming? Yes, my mommy taught me the tale of the stars. It's a really pretty story. Do you want me to tell it? Please, Saina, I would like that very much. Okay. This is my tale, the tale of stars, and I tell it to you in my own words, as it was told to me by my teacher in her words. In the small village of Jinjay near the rumbling hills of Onion, there lived a girl called Mona. She was a curious girl, and she would always get in the way of grown elation. Go play somewhere else, they would say to Mona. But she didn't want to play with the other children. She wanted to be where the grown-ups were, to see what they were doing, and learn from them. But one day, after getting many complaints from the pottery makers, and guardsmen, and traders, and soldiers in the village, Mona's mother told her that she wasn't to interfere with the grown-ups anymore. And that instead, she could go play with the other children, or sit still and draw, or work with clay. But Mona was always curious, and now, since she wasn't to be among the grown elation anymore, she decided to go exploring the forest that lay just outside of the village of Jinjay. She had many times been forbidden to enter the forest because it could be a dangerous place, but Mona was very curious. Of course she wasn't planning on going far into the forest, but then her eye caught sight of a white fluff tail hopping through the tall grass, and Mona, curious as ever, gave chase. The fluff tail ran away into the forest, and Mona followed, blind to where she was going, and interested only in catching the white fluff tail so that she could keep it as a pet. But then, after a good while, the fluff tail disappeared into a hole in the ground, leaving Mona alone in a small clearing somewhere deep inside the forest. She was exhausted after running after the fluff tail for so long, and as she looked around at the clearing at the unfamiliar trees and flowers, she realized that she hadn't been paying attention to where she was going. Not for the first time, her curiosity had gotten the better of her, but this time it was serious. Mona was too young to fly, and she had very little sense of direction, and chasing the white fluff tail had made her dizzy and tired. It was getting darker, and Mona was all alone in the deep, dangerous forest, too sleepy and too scared to be able to go anywhere. Mona curled up with her wings wrapped around her under the leaves of a tree. and began crying. Soon it got really dark, and somewhere, not far away, wolves started howling at the moon. Mona was so scared, she was petrified. But after a while, her exhaustion got the better of her, and she fell asleep. She woke up when she heard a voice calling her from somewhere far above. Looking up at the starry sky, Mona saw a vision of the spirits of five tellers gazing down at her. You have let your curiosity leave you astray, said one. You are lost, and you deserve to be lost, said another. Poor little girl, said a third. We will help you home, said a fourth. But remember this, said the fifth spirit. We will lead you back to your village and to your mother only if you promise us one thing. 
I promise, said Mona. Whatever it is, I promise I will do it. Very well, said the first spirit. You will make the story of this night into your own tale, and you will call it the Tale of Stars. It will be a tale to warn the curious to be careful, continued the third spirit, and to not let their curiosity get the better of them. And, said the second spirit, to remind the elation that the spirits of their tellers watch out for them when they most need it. And so the spirits of the five tellers guided Mona through the forest, and by dawn she was home. And Mona did tell her tale, the tale of stars, to everyone in the village, so that everyone would remember that the curious must be cautious, and that the spirits of the tellers are always watching. This was my tale, the tale of stars, and I told it in my own words as my teacher did to me. That was a beautiful tale, Saina. Thank you. Goodbye, Saina. You're leaving again? I wish you could stay. Me too, Saina, believe me. Well, thank you for the lovely story. You're a great storyteller for your age, especially. I was able to follow that whole thing. Do you know one of the four tales of winds, stars, sea, and homecoming? Mine is the tale of sea, human. Would you mind telling it to me? I would be happy to do so. This is the tale of sea told in my own words, as it was told to me by my teacher in his words, and to him by his teacher in his words. This was a very, very long time ago, when the Alation were a strong people, and we could spend days riding the hot winds above the seas. We hunted fish then, and we were at war with the Merum the wet tails. Akalis was one of the strongest warriors there was. His claws were sharp and long, his beak pointy, and his teeth strong. Akalis was admired by everyone in his clan, and because of this, he was cocky and arrogant. So one day, the teller of Akalis city asked him to perform a very important and very special duty, to bring a sacred jewel to the teller of an Alation town across the sea. This particular jewel was very important because it signified a union between the two towns, and it would benefit the people of both that it was delivered safely and promptly. Akalis grinned and told the teller that he would deliver the jewel both quickly and safely and that she was not to worry. But the teller did worry because Akalis was young and too sure of himself. But she wanted to test him and to teach him that sharp claws, a pointy beak, and strong teeth are not all a warrior needs that a warrior must also be wise and careful. So Akalis set out across the sea on his flight. It was on the fourth day that he spotted something in the water that caught his attention. And forgetting his duty and following his curiosity, Akalis dived towards the water to investigate. When he came closer, he saw that there were merum in the water foolishly hunting close to the surface, and Akalis saw an opportunity to again prove his might. As a great warrior to his people, and to capture the fins of a few wet tails. But this time, Akalis' arrogance got the better of him, because the Merum had set a trap. As he dived towards the Merum with his claws, a spear shot up from the water to hit him. Akalis struck the water, and dropped the jewel he was carrying, and it was all he could do not to drown. Akalis was bleeding, and the Merim were grabbing onto his wings and his legs, but he fought bravely, and finally he managed to escape. But even though he now lived, 
he was dead inside because the shame of losing the sacred jewel would always be with him. The Carlos could not return to his village because he had neglected his duty to his teller and to his people. And so he went away to a small island where he could be alone. To himself and his people, a Carlos now became the lost one. He who had been on a sacred mission but had failed in his arrogance. A year passed, and one day a Carlos met with human traders from a ship that came close to his island. From the traders, a Carlos heard speak of a hideous creature that lived in the sea, the Octowo. The Octowo was said to have a third eye, like a jewel and that this eye pulled hapless sailors into its deadly eight-armed grasp. Akalis knew immediately that the Octowo's third eye had to be the jewel that he lost in the sea a year ago, and he now saw the opportunity to redeem himself. But the nation were not used to water, and the thought of submerging himself in the cold, harsh ocean chilled Akalis to his heart. But he was the lost one, and if in his death he could at the very least redeem himself, to his own heart then it would be worth it. So Achilles fashioned himself a spear, because in the water his claws and his beak would be too slow, and he flew out to where the octavo was last seen. And then Achilles dived into the sea. The dark water closed in on him and his wings and legs went numb. But still, Akalis kept pushing down until he saw the lair of the Octowo. Sparking Akalis, the Octowo attacked, and Akalis saw the monster's third eye, his sacred jewel, shining bright in the darkness. And his heart was filled with a sense of duty and courage that he had never felt before. But as he began fighting the eight-armed monster, Akaris realized that if he were to fight like he usually did, he would not stand a chance. He would have to think differently. And so Akaris tricked the Octowo into following him through a tight chasm where the monster got stuck. And then he swam above it and, using his spear, tipped a rock on top of the Octowo. Swimming back down again, the Octowo was flailing helplessly. Now, almost out of air, Akalis took the sacred jewel from the Octowo's head and swam back up. Finally, Akalis could deliver the sacred jewel to the town across the sea. And upon returning to his village, he went to the teller, bowed his head, and said, Forgive me, teller. For in my arrogance, I thought I could do everything, but I could not, and I became the lost one because of it. You were lost, said the teller, but you are no more, because now you see the limits of your own strength, and you will know that a warrior must be careful and wise in addition to being strong and fierce. This was the tale of C, and I told it in my own words, as told to me by my teacher. Thank you. You are both the librarian and the storyteller. Your whole job is knowing books and stories. So, Isam, that's your name, isn't it? Yes. Isam of Tamar. A good-looking guy like you must get a lot of attention from the girls, right? Are you asking me for courtship? <laughs> me? No. Wings don't do anything for me. No, I was just thinking, maybe you had your eye out for somebody special? I'm without a mate. The women of Tamar are cold and unfriendly, and whenever I try to talk to one of them, she ignores me. Huh. Even Nima? Nima? No, she's too pretty for me. 
She won't appreciate my attention. This is like high school. Trust me, Isam. You go talk to her one of these days, and I'm sure you'll find you have a lot in common. Just be yourself, okay? You think so? Perhaps you are right. I will do as you say, Windbringer. Thank you. Do you know one of the four tales of winds, stars, sea, and homecoming? Mine is the tale of winds, Windbringer. Do you wish to hear it? Very much. Then I shall tell it. This is the tale of winds, my tale. And I pledge to tell it in my own words, as told in turn by my teacher. In the village of Karan, in the mountains of tall winds, there lived a young Alatian woman named Iwana. Iwana had one desire above all others, to soar higher and farther than anyone else. And even though her wings were no broader, nor her body sleeker than anyone else's, she pursued this foolish desire without rest. And as time passed, she did soar higher, and she did fly farther than the other young Alation in her village. And her name became known far and wide amongst the tribes of the mountains of tall winds. But still, Iwana was not happy. She was not happy because, in her vanity, even though she was a better flyer than almost everyone else, and to her eyes, she was still not good enough. She wanted to be so much better than anyone else that she would be remembered for all time as the best flyer amongst all the elation. And so one day, Iwana decided to climb to the top of Mount Bakta'ana, the Tower of Light, and to soar from those giddy heights to the ends of the world. Her friends and her family pleaded with her not to, because every elation knew that to soar from such heights was dangerous, that at such heights the air was thin and the winds treacherous. But Iwana would not listen, and on a cold and clear morning she climbed up the Tower of Light to the rock and the ice at the very top. From there she could see to the ends of the world. And it brought tears to her eyes to know that now, finally, she would be greater and better than any elation before her. And so Iwana spread her wings and leaped off the mountain. Those who watched her from far below said that for a split moment, Iwana soared, and she soared higher and farther than any elation before or since. But then the treacherous winds caught a hold of her, and the thin air made her plummet towards the ground and to fall to her death amongst the rocks at the base of the mountain. In her vanity, Iwana could not see beyond her desire to be the very best. And vanity always stands to fall. That was the tale of winds, my tale, and I told it in my own words, as told to me in turn by my teacher. All right, well, everyone, thank you for your tales of the sea, the wind, the stars, and homecoming. They will all be very helpful for us to get into the teller which we'll do in the next one. So I'll see you then for that. Thanks for watching.